Yeah. So when everybody's uh, <laughs> grabbed their seat, uh, we're, we're going to start the, uh, the workshop panel today. And uh, my, my name's Gary Schwartz. I'm president of the Canadian Lenders Association. And uh, we are running these series of workshops on a monthly basis uh, in order to sort of build curriculum for our summit that we can be running in November. So these are a series of sort of uh, workshops, and we use the word workshop, though it's a panel, because we want to make sure that this is an interesting process. There's no point in you guys getting up early, other than to have some really nice coffee and snacks, if you're just going to listen to people passively. I want you to be able to ask questions. This is an itch to process, so don't feel shy about interrupting the panel midway and asking a, a, a question, as long as it's germane. So, uh, so with that, I, uh, I wanted to uh, walk you through a little bit of what we're doing here with Canadian Lenders Association. I wanted to first thank uh, our sponsors today, uh, Deloitte and On Deck, uh, you know, for supporting this workshop, and also for Crystal Financial, Silicon Valley Bank, and uh, us, of course. And then uh, thank you very much for McCarthy for putting on this amazing spread and then hosting us uh, in this uh, corner boardroom here with this beautiful view. So uh, thank you again to our sponsors. Um, if you don't know, the Canadian Lenders Association was founded by lenders for lenders. And uh, we, we represent B2B and B2C lenders across Canada who, uh, people call them al al alternative lenders. We like to refer to them as innovative lenders because they have to use innovation, technology, and innovative business practices in order to differentiate themselves from the incumbent lenders. And so there's a lot of amazing things going on within our member group. Uh, and we'd love you to get involved with what we do. Uh, we, we basically have a number of pillars. One is advocacy and policy work, and we're doing that continually across Canada on a provincial and federal level. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we do um, a lot of thought leadership work, um, not only running workshops and, and summits at the end of the year, but we also do a lot of online uh, workshops uh, that, we, that we run on top of uh, LinkedIn. And, uh, and then uh, finally, we, we develop tools uh, for the industry that, that, uh, that makes sense to do ag in an aggregated fashion as opposed to one firm developing them. We develop solutioning that can be adopted by multiple members. Uh, one example would be Smartbox that we're launching uh, now actually with uh, OnDeck being our anchor. Uh, which is a, ca a capital comparis uh, a transparency tool for the marketplace. It's a way of, of uh, SMEs uh, um, comparing apples and apples in the marketplace. So, uh, the, um, so please get involved. Please contact me. Uh, Additionally, uh, we, we really like right. to have a big media footprint, so we will be filming this event, and uh, if anybody's shy, please let me know. Uh, we may film your questions, and we will be filming the panel. And uh, we like to put that on a larger stage because we like to think of these workshops really as a green screen to a national audience. Um, uh, again, our, our lenders event, please put it in your calendar, will be on, uh, in, in November. At, uh, on November 20th, uh, we have obviously private dinners and, and other events leading up to it, but on the November 20th, we'll be at Mars, and, uh, and we're really excited about that because that'll be a culmination of the thought leadership for the year. We, we tend to double our audience every year, um, so, uh, so please come along. Uh, and, uh, and then we have our Innovation Awards, and I please, it's open now for uh, any uh, uh, nominations you may have. It's for executives in the lending uh, sphere that are doing exceptional work uh, to move the industry ahead. And if you go to the Canadian uh, LendersSummit.com, you'll see that there's a simple form if you want to nominate any of your colleagues. Again, it's not a, about the company, it's about the individual. Uh, <coughs> last year, uh, Eva Wong and Andrew Graham uh, won the award, and, uh, and we'll see who gets the Tiffany plaque this year. Uh, and then, today, uh, we are hosting a, a discussion on, uh, on, on, on uh, specialty finance that uh, Anna Verdure, who's a partner uh, in financial services at McCarthy, is going to uh, walk us through. Uh, I'm going to ask Anna to introduce our panel and to... Uh, to MC. So thank you so much, Anna. 
Thank you, Gary, and thank you, everyone, uh, for attending this uh, session this morning. Uh, very much looking forward to this panel discussion. It's intended to be a practical and, as uh, Gary said, interactive discussion. So feel free uh, to uh, have it, uh, ask any questions as, as uh, they arise. Uh, we noticed here at McCarthy's, you know, that specialty finance was an emerging area in Canada. It's much more mature in the U.S., and, and uh, thankfully we've got some U.S. perspectives as well here, so we can compare and contrast. Uh, but with the rise of uh, fintech, and particularly non-bank lenders in Canada, uh, specialty finance has been an area of focus increasingly as well. Uh, so really wanted to today have you know, practical discussions about deal considerations, because uh, obviously to these types of entities, uh, funding is a, is a key consideration, and how to structure those Funding transactions is is uh, you know particular to that segment and uh, definitely something that is worthwhile of discussion and consideration. Uh, I will ask each panelist to introduce themselves. Uh, I think everyone here has a really interesting perspective. We've got lenders, we've got borrowers, uh, and we've got advisors up on this panel. So we've got a variety of different perspectives. So maybe maybe let's start with Win. Sure. So um, Win Bear with Silicon Valley Bank. Um, currently based in Boston, but soon to be moving to Toronto, actually. And so for the past several years with SVB, I've sort of helped on a cross-border basis, helped grow our business up here to the point where we've um, finally established a Toronto office and uh, received our lending branch license, which is an exciting step for us, Canada, generally speaking. And certainly the GTA is an incredibly exciting market for what we do, which is um, cater kind of specifically to a unique set of industries, innovation sector broadly, uh, which would include, of course, tech and all the niches you would expect within tech, FinTech, of course, um, life sciences, all the niches you would expect within there, VC and private equity firms, and then we do on the west coast of the U.S., and sadly I have nothing to do with this part of our business. We, we bank premium wineries on the west coast of the U.S. <laughs> but um, um, and, uh, um, So you know, slightly different uh, banking landscape, of course, in the States than in Canada. There's still seven or 8,000 banks in the U.S., um, if you ranked them all by asset size, we'd be probably, you know, 40, 42. That's, that's a little misleading because after about the top 10, they, they drop off pretty precipitously. But um, we were about, you know, 56 billion in assets. So, you know, reasonably sized balance sheet, but still nimble enough to um, be fast moving and entrepreneurial enough for, for our clients' expectations. I guess my perspective um, in the context of this panel will be really more on the, um, you know, business banking side of things, specifically for companies in the innovation space. Um, we don't really do any consumer banking. The caveat there would be our, what we call our private bank, which really caters specifically to uh, partners at VC or PE firms or C-level execs at our client companies. But for the most part, um, you've got some better experts on the consumer lending side, but um, I can certainly chime in on the, on the business lending side. Wonderful. And uh, congratulations on the Canadian loan. Thanks. Thank you. Cheryl. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Cheryl Carner. I'm also from Boston, but I am not moving to Toronto. Um, but I, I do enjoy coming up here quite a bit. I've been um, at Crystal since 2011. We've been active in the Canadian market here um, since about 2012. We initially um, started lending in the more traditional industries. We've always done a lot in retail and consumer products and some industrials and um, equipment finance. And then as we started doing some specialty finance transactions in the United States, which was really incubating kind of in the 2012-2013 timeframe, um, we started to see some opportunities here in Canada. And one of the first companies that we worked with, and really um, a great poster child both for them and for us, was um, Easy Financial. And so we started working with them specifically to finance their um, unsecured consumer um, credit uh, product, which was separate and distinct from their um, rent-to-own stores, and help them grow that portfolio um, over many years. And um, fortunately, then they were able to access the, the high-yield market. But we've also been um, very active in all different types of subsectors of specialty finance. So whether that's rent to own, merchant catch advance, um, unsecured consumer installment loans, um, we've looked at litigation finance and, and many other sectors. And so typically 
um, where we're active is in providing senior secured debt um, to these companies. Typically, um, they have some level of institutional capital that they've used to grow their portfolio to a certain level, and then they realize that they've got both enough history and enough girth to get back leverage and use debt to facilitate their growth. So in almost all instances, what we're providing is growth capital. So our minimum transaction size is 10 million, and we've um, underwritten or clubbed up or arranged um, transactions upwards of a couple hundred million. So delighted to be here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Amar Wali. I lead uh, On Deck Canada here. Um, on Deck is a is a phenomenal story. So we started the business back in 07 to solve a major challenge facing small business financing. Uh, so we are the uh, we're the world's largest online small business lender. We've deployed more than 10 billion dollars globally in small business loans. Uh, we're a publicly traded company. We were listed on the New York Stock Exchange back in 2014. Some of our original investors include the likes of a, of Google Ventures, Peter Thiel, uh, Sat Ventures as well. We were the uh, the first non SBA lender to actually go to the securitization market in 2017. Sorry, 2014 as well. Uh, so our, our capital stack is very mature. So uh, institutional lenders include the likes of a of a BlackRock, Credit Suisse, Credit Agricole, SunTrust. Uh, we like distinct types of credit facilities that enable us to provide scale and flexibility overall. Uh, what we do really is use a, um, a wide spectrum of data, technology, and analytics that, one, enables us to provide real-time credit decisions, but also provide a, a best-of-breed customer experience. And we're, all we are is about the customer. So we're, we're engaged with the customer. We want to provide them with the, uh, with the most exceptional type of customer experience we'll get from the small business world. And we're able to originate loans within 24 hours. And, and as well, on deck had a bit of an announcement yesterday, so you can. Oh yeah. Add that <laughs> so in. We, uh, we we just completed our first M&A transaction. So on deck Canada <coughs> merged with Evelocity Financial Group. Uh, we're really excited about the the deal overall. It accelerates our growth in Canada, and we're looking forward to providing Canadians with a, a best of breed small business lending solution that will really propel their uh, their growth going forward. Congratulations on that. All right. It's great news, Amar. Um, I try my best not to go after Amar um, and, and the speaking panel, but wasn't set up very nicely. Difficult to match, <laughs> difficult to match the energy. But uh, Ramit Malhotra, I'm a partner, senior managing director at Deloitte. I lead Deloitte's investment banking business uh, for Central Canada. Uh, it's about 80 people coast to coast, about 40, 45 of those sit in Central Canada. Different industry focuses, uh, but one of the key ones is specialty finance. And if you ask me, I wasn't an expert. I was a novice about four years ago in specialty finance. We, a lot of people in this room kind of learned to trade together. And, and that's why we all kind of know each other. And here we are. We've done uh, 14 closed deals, just over a couple billion dollars in total capital range for Canadian mid-market companies. Deal sizes have ranged from as small as $30 million at the low end to $1.1 billion in one case. So it's been, it's been a great story across all asset classes. Uh, I've been saying for the last 12 to 18 months that we're going to run out of issuers. But uh, thanks to the issuer market, we haven't run out of issuers. We have eight deals in the market, over $900 million in total capital, and I don't want that to change. Happy to be here. Um, thanks, Anna. I'm, uh, my name is TJ Lind. I'm a partner in the financial services group here at McCarthy's uh, in their Toronto office. Uh, my practice focuses in the financial services space. I, I do, I'd say about 70% of my practice is focused in the lending space. Uh, so everything from leverage finance uh, to corporate finance and um, <clears throat> an emerging area that we've noticed over the last three years, especially finance. We've completed a number of especially finance transactions over the last few years um, from a range of different structures. Uh, including uh, your traditional revolving facilities and term facilities, but also some of your securitization facilities uh, for those, um, <clears throat> especially finance companies that kind of have scaled up in the uh, capital stack, and then also for um, some, of, some of the stuff in the high yield space. So we've done a number of different transactions and um, happy to be on the panel today. Great. Uh, so we've got a, a wonderful panel, so let's dive into it. Uh, first question, uh, what are some of the threshold questions when considering how to implement a transaction in this space. And I'll turn to Ramit for this one. Yeah, I'm happy to start. So a few things come to, 
to mind when I think about, you know, the first ever discussion with a prospective client starts with the client, right? What their objectives are. So what are the, some of the key pillars? And I wrote this down because I've got a small brain. But uh, one, I'd start with purpose, right? What's the purpose of the capital that you're trying to put together? Second would be the economics of your underlying product. What is your loan product? Are you an MCA with a 40% gross yield, or are you a home improvement lender who is fully secured with a nosy on the property, and as a result are happy getting 8.5% on your book? Third is structure, and there's a lot that goes into that. And number four would be, would be the source of the capital, where, where the money's going to come from. And it's, these four things have a very good amount of interplay between them. As you solve for one, the other thing moves. But I'll, I'll touch maybe a bit on that a bit more. So purpose, just in the last few months alone, it's all in the recency effect in your head as you're thinking about these things. So the, the, it could be multifold. It could be, hey, I'm looking for an adjacent funder to my existing funding that's in place. I'm looking for an inaugural institutional funder. I've been funded with LP money to date. But it's, end of the day, my core loan book funding. That could be one purpose. The other purpose would, could be I've been in business for several number of years. The funders have been a bit restrictive. I've got a lot of equity tied up in the loan book. I can extract that equity tomorrow and put it towards whatever I want, right? Haircut funding, corporate growth, whatever the case is. Third could be just getting haircut funding. Right, I've matured as a business the last time I went to market, and now haircut funding can come not just from equity, but some incremental MES capacity. Right? And the last could be just corporate growth, growth projects, not at the loan book at the funding level, but at the corporate financing level. So those are the purposes. Like That's where you start with as, as the issuer on what are you trying to accomplish. If you think about the next thing, which I call the product economics and cash flow, I, I think I should have started there, actually. That's number one. We've seen clients, and we've been, at times, been guilty of not course correcting it quickly enough, that not every product has the same number of potential capital providers to go and seek capital from. It goes back to what I said earlier. Understand your product's beauty and limitations. So if you're a 40% yielding, gross, 30% net, You've got a and a ten year average term to your underlying say small business loan or MCA product that's got a different capital provider market associated to it than a home improvement ten to fifteen year term nine percent gross eight and a half net it's a totally different way of solving the same funding problem. The net result may be I want the next hundred million dollars, but where it comes from is dependent on where you start in your product. <coughs> Next, I'd say structure. Um, even I see the funders in the room here, and there's a gamut of, you know, starting from Cheryl to, to Rajan, there's a, there's a gamut of, you know, people who think in terms of SPVs being the only way to do the deal versus corporate finance, oh, sorry, the, the motherhood, the, the corporate entity, the mothership itself would be the only way they'd do the deal. Within that, they'll start peeling the onion on, uh, are we a strictly an advanced rate borrowing base type funder, or are we a NPV? I'm going to discount the cash flows and get to the implied advance rate that way. So all of that. And again, I'm getting into more detail than I planned on, but these <coughs> levers, the more discussion you can have openly with as, as a prospective issuer, with your, well, well, one, get an advisor, right? No, no, no biases there, but uh, <laughs> the, have those, 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 that thought, that, that, that you know, back and forth in your head or with your advisor right up front so that you're not spinning your wheels going to solve the wrong problem or going to the wrong capital sources to solve it. Great. Any other perspectives maybe from the borrower side? Um, yeah, so, so when, when we look at um, specialty finance, we, we've taken a more of an institutional approach to capital markets. So uh, definitely having a purpose-driven methodology and mandate makes a lot more sense. But uh, we're, we're trying to find the most optimal funding structure that enables our business to grow. And, and every lender is going to be different across our stack overall. Uh, so we are looking for, for institutional partners that provide us with the, the level of scale, uh, the right credibility, the right brand, the, the right type of structure overall, the right type of uh, cost of capital. Um, and each one of those facilities is unique to the type of purpose that we're actually trying to drive. So if it's a, if it's a loan book funding, it's going to look very, very different. If it's a mezzanine line, it's going to look very, very different overall. Uh, but once again, taking it all the way back, it's, it's using that element of corporate strategy to really identify 
what you're trying to achieve and looking at the, the best type of market uh, uh, institutional partners available to help you execute those. Um, so we like we like revolving facilities. We like SPVs. Um, we we like to have the flexibility that uh, having a three year term or four year revolving structure overall. We like low cost of capital. Uh, we like distinct types of advance rates and, and unique ABS structures. We've also done a range of private transactions and, and home loan sales as well. Um, so it's really about, as, as a lender, having the distinct type of flexibility that enables your business to grow. So really having a, a diversified capital structure overall. Yeah, I think what's interesting about what Amar said is that um, of all the different I guess, data points that he's looking at when he's evaluating different financings, you know, cost of capital was actually at the end, um, I noticed. And interest and in, but but Ramit's point is is accurate too in that you know for example each lender has their own yield targets that they have to deliver and their own cost of capital so you know for example even if i love a credit i just can't price a deal at five percent money that win may be able to because we're just not structured that way so i think that you know between your advisor if you and you should have one, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, really identifying the yield of your product and therefore what, what type of yield you can afford or target, I think is important, but putting that aside, all these other factors are actually, I would say, more important than the, than the cost of capital and being aligned with your lender in terms of ability to grow, um, what type of advance rates you could get, the flexibility, um, how that lender is going to be able to work with you, not just to get the transaction closed, but how they're going to be your financial partner post-close is also critically important. So all of those factors come into play, but I would say our cost of capital at the end of the day, it feels like the most important, but it probably is I don't want to say the least, but definitely not at the top. Yeah, you, you could get a line at, at LIBOR plus one or two, uh, but if your advance rate is only 35 to 40%, you still have to go to the equity markets, or you have to go to the mezzanine markets, and your blended cost of capital might be above 12%. So that, that really limits your, your excess spread overall. Um, so once again, it's really, as a lender, it's really important to understand what your unique strategy that you're trying to achieve, what is the, the tranche that you're going after, um, what does the, the yield capabilities and stride metrics look like within that specific tranche, and what provides the, the most amount of flexibility for your business as, as, as originators that we're, we're here to grow. Um, so if you, if you structure a facility that, that limits your, your applicability to grow, that really hinders your business. So you want to have that flexibility overall. No, just uh, one thing I just want to add is that you mentioned, yeah, your financial partner post-closing, but you also have to think about if your structure includes a senior MES uh, component, you got to make sure your partners are able to work together. So if you're trying to put a senior uh, institutional investor together with a, a MES fund, you just have to make sure that they're able to work together. And maybe a threshold question you should hammer out early is some of the inner creditor terms about how the senior and the MES are going to play together. Because I've seen deals where they just say customary inner creditor terms. And that's depending if you're the senior lender or if you're the MES lender, uh, you'll, you'll have different views on what's customary. And the borrower is kind of the meat in the sandwich, and they're going to kind of get smacked together between the two. Uh, so. I've seen deals fail over intercreditor terms not being able to come together. So I think you need to keep that in mind uh, as part of a threshold discussion. Um, the other thing um, uh, is that you should think about just the return on investment. So if it's a term loan, thinking about what type of prepayment premiums that might need to be negotiated. I've seen borrowers not Did have any. Have with, those? No, just. <laughs> I, I've seen borrowers not have that discussion with some other. Uh, lenders, and then you get to the stage where it's legal counsel, they say, oh yeah, we want all of our customary prepayment premiums, please put them in the document, and then the borrower sees them, and they're like, what? I have to pay how much percent if I pay this early? So to Amar's point, you know, maybe there isn't flexibility for your business, so you just have to keep that <coughs> in mind. Some, some lenders uh, have put that into their run rate, right? They want to know that they will get that return, so if you pay me back, in year one that you're going to make me whole for what had been paid if the loan was out for five years. If I, if I could just add one thing and just, just zooming back for big picture, as an issuer, think about your opportunity cost. 
when you're fine-tuning these terms up front or during the financing process, think of if you're delaying the deal by way of going back and forth with too many funders or the selected funder. What is it costing you when you're saving that extra 30 basis points or the 2.5% extra advance rate? Could you have originated $40 more million worth of underlying receivables that you're holding yourself back from? We see more and more people. It all, it's going to all have interplay with prepayment penalties. Okay, so if that's the sticking point on a transaction that's holding it from closing, yeah, you've got to fine-tune that. But if you're going to win 18 months of prepayment versus 12 or 15, just weigh that at all times with your opportunity cost or what you're not funding with the money that you don't have in the tent right now. And just to add to that, actually, so if, if you look at the fintech space, uh, what makes issuers in the fintech space a bit more unique in the sense is that we're, we're data-driven. So we're able to monitor our portfolios and really understand the, the funding capabilities and requirements. Um, so we can build out much more holistic strategies when it comes to long-term plans to attract that capital. So for example, like if it's six months down the road, I'll know today how much capital I need down the road and use the data to derive those type of estimations. Um, <clears throat> want to keep going because we've gone through one question in half an hour, I think, but uh, that's great discussion. But and the next point I wanted to focus on is really the Canadian versus U.S. perspective. And uh, maybe I'll throw it to, to Wynn and Cheryl to uh, tackle that in terms of, you know, what's different from the Canadian and U.S. markets that, that you might see? Uh, and, and why would, for example, a Canadian fintech go to a, a U.S. funding source? Sure, I can start. I mean, a couple of, maybe to overly simplify, I mean, a couple of the seemingly obvious ones are, you know, the number of players, um, certainly in the U.S. versus Canada, and that's a combination of banks and non-banks, of course. Um, pros and cons to that. I mean, the, yeah, the seemingly the obvious pros are um, more options in the states. The, the seemingly obvious negative is it's really harder to weed out the chumps uh, from, um, you know, from, from a big process, really. <laughs> I'm not saying we're, we're, we're always the greatest option either, but, like, there are... It's amazing to me some of the just entities that, that come out of the woodwork really more so in the, in the, in the states than, than than here. That's um, why you need an advisor. That's why an advisor can help. Um, and yeah, so th that's one I would say. And this is um, where you get into maybe dangerous generalizations or, or stereotypes. But at least in our, within our client base, in the U.S., there is um, historically been maybe a, a more aggressive appetite for taking on debt um, capital and the the. Yeah, you know, flip side of that, because we're never looking, at least in our world, as debt as a substitute for you know, venture capital or growth equity, et cetera. But you just, in general, you're, you see kind of more aggressive behavior, whether it's around, you know, on the equity side, you know, burn rates these companies are willing to embrace. Um, I'm not saying that's a great thing. It just seems to be the more more um, more the norm in the states, um, and therefore, you know, some of the you know, attitudes around debt are. Um, seemingly a bit more aggressive, both from the investor side and the, the company side in the States. Um, but I'll, I'll, you're also seeing a shift in, the, in some of that behavior in the Canadian invasion space. I mean, it's uh, you know, very few, and the clear um, evidence of that is, you know, every Canadian bank is now in the you know, technology banking space, and um, you're seeing you know, folks like us come from, you know, other, other areas to pursue a really... Um, you know, attractive opportunity in, in Canada. So you're seeing some of that mentality shift a bit um, in, in Canada and seeing more aggressive behavior. And I'd be curious to hear, you know, the pa other panelists' perspectives on that. Mine's, again, very much limited to kind of the companies in the innovation space. So, yeah. so I would say that um, one of the reasons, or wins right in that a um, handful of years ago, specialty finance or fintech was one of the few industries that I would really have characterized as underbanked. And so there was a lot of opportunity both in the United States and here in Canada. Um, while I will say um, that there are, you know, fewer players for this particular sector than, let's say, a widget manufacturer, I wouldn't necessarily call it underbanked anymore. And we've really seen quite a bit of price compression and spreads um, that we can charge, honestly, because of more options. Um, I think that there are not <coughs> very many um, 
uh, dissimilarities between the U.S. and the Canadian market, meaning the way that we approach credit and the way that we approach our underwriting is the same for a U.S. business versus a Canadian business, where we have to get very granular, though, about the differences is particularly on the legal diligence side and particularly the regulatory legal diligence. And, um, you know, especially when you're doing anything that's consumer facing. So, um, that is a very unique aspect of specialty finance, but it does apply to both the U.S. and Canada, but it applies a little bit differently, right? So in the United States, we are looking not just at you know, federal laws and being concerned about the posture or tenor of the CFPB um, with regard to certain products um, within specialty finance, but then you also have to look at state regulations. It, it's sort of the same here where we have to look both at the federal level and also at the province level. So that is um, an important aspect in, in transactions um, as it relates to the diligence that, uh, that applies to both. For sure, and, and that leads uh, nicely into our next point, which was around diligence, although it sounds like there may be a bit more still on this question, but let me just... <laughs> I, I, I practice in the regulatory space, so I certainly see from a diligence perspective, you know, it is a very different thing um, in Canada, in the U.S., and, and even, you know, province by province. So, for example, in, in Canada, certain provinces have enacted high-cost lender uh, licensing and disclosure requirements. Uh, there are different um, consumer protection laws provincially. There are some on the federal side that are relevant as well, uh, including, you know, we've seen concerns around interest act uh, disclosure uh, in some of the, uh, the, the consumer facing documentation, for example, or, or even the business lending documentation. And, and, you know, these areas are constantly evolving from a legal perspective and uh, are very much kind of areas of focus for, for regulators. And so uh, it really does matter uh, that you have someone with the right expertise, uh, including in the right jurisdiction. Uh, unlike certain other areas where diligence may be more general, it's very particular in, in these types of areas. Um, so that was an aside, but I, I could tell that there is still something on, on the last point that you wanted to get in. I, I like to be controversial. <laughs> uh, so having worked in the fixed income markets for a long time, I think you're I think the U.S. is is much more mature when it comes to specialty finance, especially around ABS. Um, when you look at the the Canadian market overall, like what is the the asset class that we've traded the most over the last twenty years? Mortgage backed securities and credit card receivables. Uh, but now the yield on those is starting to get compressed and it's starting to get thin. So as as institutional investors, as you as you start to get more savvy and you want more yield, you're starting to look at more asoteric asset classes. Uh, asoteric asset classes in the U.S. have been very common for a number of years. Uh, Mortgage-backed securities, CDOs, CLOs. Those asset classes are not heavily traded in Canada, but you're starting to see a bit of a changing in the guard when it comes to um, investor behavior overall. And, and online lending is one of those in the sense that it's, it's just... It's more mature. Uh, so if you look back at the at the recession in 2008, um, the reason why you know the market collapsed is because nobody knew what the hell they were buying. You had you had blocks of CLOs and CDOs that had tranches of of underlying assets that had absolutely no bearing or no understanding at all. But now, if you look at the uh, the the online lending segment, there's just so much more data. There's so much more data to really understand what the underlying assets are, and that is what's making the asset class so unique overall in terms of capabilities. So you're starting to see a lot more institutional investors in Canada pay a lot more attention to it. Uh, it's great to see Rajan in the room and paying attention, um, but it's a it's a very it's a very exciting asset class overall, and it's definitely appealing for the Canadian market, uh, and it will change the way that um, credit is is overall uh, performed in Canada and understood from a, a pure trading asset class point of view. I think the, one of the implied question is why bother going to the U.S. market for a Canadian issuer? And yes, part of the answer is it's a deep market. Why not? But the beauty of this market is it's inefficient because it's not mature. Yes, it's getting more and more mature. It's come a long way, especially for the Canadian issuers. But <coughs> what we see when, a run a, when we run a financing process is how differently similarly set up funds or banks would look at a credit opportunity or the same fund would look at a similar credit opportunity differently from the way they did a month ago. 
So it's the inefficiency in this market versus, say, a bond market where you're you know, negotiating on the last five basis points of spread that you can gain as an issuer 100, 200 basis points or 10% of advance rate back and forth. And that keeps us excited in extracting that, that last bit. But, Cheryl, you, you would not love to hear that, but, <laughs> but it, that, that, that's it. Like, that, that's what keeps she us give going. you a number of softballs to, uh, yes. <laughs> and then you do that to her. <laughs> and, uh, and the other thing I'd say is the, the U.S. funders, and this is, this is something for the Canadian issuers in the room to take note of, they find the Canadian conservatism very refreshing. <laughs> right when when they look at right when they look at the same asset class issue, like I keep talking about MCH, it's just recency effect. But the the lack of stacking that's that happens in Canada versus the U.S. and the MCA product, or in a consumer loan product, the amount of net yield an issuer in Canada is able to extract because there's less competition in the Canadian market as an online lender, it's very refreshing for U.S. providers. Auto as a non-prime auto, as an asset class, it's come off the peak by a long shot in the US. I would argue we're not there yet in Canada. So if they're looking to more de- deploy more and more capital and they're seeing the US issuers as less favorable, it's time for the Canadians to, to gain ground, and, and that's been happening. You do anything from your... Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so- uh, on diligence, yeah. uh, you know, we, we chatted about it a, a little bit. Uh, any other perspectives to offer do, there? Do you want me to jump in from the legal and then sure. Sure. Yeah. jump in yeah. from the business side? So in terms of the legal diligence, uh, I think you touched on it, Anna, a little bit, but uh, for the, especially for the uh, fintech or online lenders that are consumer-facing, a lot of the time we're asked to, if we're on for the lender or on for the issuer, we're asked to typically look at their consumer-facing documents and actually check if they're actually complying with applicable consumer protection laws. So uh, we'll have regulatory lawyers, such as Anna, uh, look at the documentation and, and look to ensure that it actually is complying with consumer protection laws. Yeah, and that's a critical, critical point. Um, we did a deal with a rent-to-own company and the way they were structuring their transactions and the language in the consumer-facing documents created um, essentially a potential issue where counsel was concerned that there could be recharacterization risk of that particular transaction from a lease to a loan. And if that recharacterization risk were to happen, that would be pretty negative, both from the company's perspective and from the lender's perspective. So as a result of that diligence, we went back to the company and said, um, we can't we can't pursue the transaction unless you're willing to both change the language on your consumer-facing documents as well as you know, tweak your product structure and change this fee or that fee or this term or that term. So what, what DJ is alluding to is absolutely paramount in an underwriting and is totally unique to specialty finance because we don't really have to do this level of diligence um, on the, I'll call it, legal business side for, let's say, a retailer or a business services company. And and so we look at the like the template documents. Hopefully, the issuer is using template documents that are being used consistently. Uh, so we look at those, but then we do sometimes do a deeper dive depending how much diligence the client wants. And you know, if we're creating a pool of consumer loans, the client might say, "Please look at you know the top five loans, or look at the." Um, just, they'll just do a random check. Send us six or seven of the completed loan documentation. And we're going to look at those, and we're going to see, are they actually completed correctly? Um, In the residential mortgage space, it's the same thing. We'll have our real estate lawyers look at the mortgage file and see, are are the real estate assets actually correct? Is the loan documentation correct? Does this issuer actually have a first priority uh, mortgage on the real estate asset that's being included in the borrowing base for that loan? So... It really depends on the level of diligence, but I'd say in the consumer space, for sure, we're looking at the documentation from a template perspective, but then, you know, 
it, things can be good from a template perspective, but who knows if they're actually using those documents and what, that's what they're getting signed. Uh, the other thing that we'll look at from a diligence perspective, and it's kind of both a legal diligence, but also a business diligence, is the underwriting and servicing policies of the, um, of the issuer and just making sure that how they're actually servicing and underwriting their loans make sense uh, and that they're doing it in accordance with applicable law. And then from a business perspective, you want to actually check that it, it aligns with the financial model that you've agreed to for putting together your transaction. Just a tip for issuers, do that diligence on yourself before uh, so you don't have to uh, have a difficult conversation with your uh, funding source at that time um, because it has led to you know deals not going forward and it's uh, you don't want to spend the time and, and resources to go down the negotiation process only to find that uh, you're not compliant in some way. Um, so that's my regulatory lawyer pitch there. <laughs> um, so maybe let, let's switch uh, gears and, and talk more specifically about covenants. Uh, what are the type of covenants that uh, on, the, on the lending side you're looking at? Sure. sure. Um, you know, it depends, of course, on the type of you know, debt instrument. I mean, we've got you know, a variety of tools like other, just like other banks um, you know, that could range from you know, no covenant structures all the way up to more um, more traditional looking structures. So, yeah, you know, as far as covenants, um, you know, again, we talked a little bit earlier, and again, it's related. I mean, we talked earlier about you know cost of capital. So, yeah, you know, your banks versus your non banks, and yeah, you know, the non banks are typically going to have a higher cost of capital, and that's going to get passed on to the banks. So non banks are bad sources of capital. They may be able to do some things structurally that the banks are not going to be willing to do. Um, even in their most you know aggressive um, moments, so yeah, you know, if we are going to look at covenants, um, you know, typically and I think every lender will say this, but we're trying to align it at least with you know KPIs or metrics that are important to the board, important to the management team. Um, are those P and L based covenants? Are they balance sheet covenants or a covenant? Um, and yeah, we can get a little creative with some of that stuff, as as can a variety of lenders. But um, you know, ultimately, you know, However you structure them, um, and this is kind of you know, just seems like you know, lending 101, but you, know, you want to give ideally you know, the borrower enough room for negative variance from plan. And then back to your point earlier about kind of um, partner reputation and who are you saddling up with and how are they going to behave when things do go off the rails a bit. Um, it, you know, that's that's really important too. And I think um, in such a, in an environment like this, and I know this will sound self-serving, but I think we'd all maybe say this to a certain degree. When, we, when you're experiencing pricing compression in an environment like this, people, and you've been in a, you know, up into the right market for an extended period of time like this, I think people start to lose a little bit of uh, focus on lender reputation. And I think it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not wishing a downturn on us by any stretch of the imagination, but when the next one comes, um, I think the quality and reputation of partner is going to be important. So that, I got off on a bit of a tangent there, but that does really tie into covenants and structure and, and pricing holistically. I would say the vast majority of the transactions that we do in the specialty finance space are predicated on the underlying performance of a pool of assets. So whether it's leases or loans um, or you know whatever other construct, and so. Yes, P&L or balance sheet oriented covenants may be important, but what's critical to us are um, asset oriented or portfolio oriented covenants. So for example, in a rent to own business, you know, they're typically trying to achieve a certain multiple on their capital, whether it might be, you know, 1.25, 1.3. And so a critical part of the diligence, we talked about the regulatory and legal side and the um, but we didn't really talk about the business uh, due diligence side and where we really spend a lot of time is um, with the management team in terms of their underwriting policy and procedures but then also really looking at the historical performance of the underlying asset class and looking at it on a static curve basis and seeing how the different um, pools that have been originated in different periods of time perform. And we're really um, setting the covenants off of that. Um, so it's, it's both off of, of history um, as well as off of, of plan and sort of, you know, combining those. 
Um, it is important for companies to have some wiggle room um, because not everything goes according to plan. And I think that there is an acceptable variance from plan where the lender is, is not impaired. Um, but the reason to have the covenant is when um, companies really underperform, the lender needs to be at the table to figure out what's gone wrong or sideways and, and figure out how to address it. And I think particularly for specialty finance companies that are focused on growth, we've seen situations where companies have been you know, so focused on growth that they've either loosened their underwriting standards in order to gain that growth, or they've gone into tangential asset classes or different products. And it's only because of the asset-oriented portfolio covenants that we were able to see and catch that things were not going as intended. And we were able to either, um, you know, bring things back on track or, you know, the company may decide to refinance us if they want to go in a different direction and we're not comfortable with, with the performance. Or we've even had companies that have gone so aggressively in pursuit of growth that they essentially grew themselves into a brick wall and had to wind down their entire company. So that's why the, um, the portfolio covenants are so critical. Uh, that we're increasingly conscious and our clients are increasingly conscious about where we are in the cycle, in the economic cycle, that it's been 10 to 11 years of a spectacular bull run. I'm not even old enough to say this, but it's been the longest bull run of my career, right? Um, and the Deloitte economist, the former economist of the TD Bank, uh, talks about when there's a turn in that cycle coming, and no one's got that crystal ball, but his crystal ball says it's in the next six to 18 months, right? And I'm tying it back to the covenant discussion that when that cycle turns and you're a non-bank lender, chances are you may trip a covenant or two. So it becomes important what the implication thereafter is, right? So there's increasingly a drawn negotiation in the agreements on the deals we have on the go after selecting the funder on what does a covenant trip do? Does it put you into default immediately? Or could there be a trigger event number one and trigger event number two? And the trigger event one would have some cure periods and the trigger event two would reduce the advance rate before putting you in default. So that as an issuer, you, you're not immediately on the back foot. And I just want to emphasize the importance, the increasing importance of that given where we are in the cycle. It's been too good for too long. So I'm, I'm just going to add to that as, as an issuer. Actually, how many issuers are in the room right now? Just raise your hand. All right, so you got a few. Fantastic. So um, going, going back to my credit default swap trading world, uh, so the other element to examine of this going into a cycle where economic risk actually exists is counterparty credit risk. So not only we as issuers are um, we're, we're evaluated based on the type of credit that we're that we're lending and we're originating, uh, but the other the other element to examine is in a downward cycle, what does your counterparty credit list risk look like for the the lender uh, of your actual facility itself? So in in some cases, structure actually might be your best friend. Um, so you want to have the, the right type of structure in place to ensure that you're limiting your capabilities when it comes to downfall risk in the event of a, a doomsday scenario such as the, the recession or a credit turn overall. Uh, you have seen a change in uh, inverse yield spreads and treasury curves in, within the present day marketplace. The Canadian banks, after a long time, just got downgraded. Uh, Mortgage-backed securities are starting to get very, very risky. So as, as an issuer, you want to ensure that your, your business is protected by having the, the right type of structure and the right type of covenants in place that enable your business to keep growing. I, I, I feel like with all these mentions of doomsday scenarios, we have uh, just a reminder that you can feel free to ask questions or make comments at any time. <laughs> and we'll leave time at the end, but uh, certainly feel free to pipe in if, if you have uh, questions on that. Uh, the only thing I'm going to add just quickly is just <clears throat> two things uh, that you typically see in especially finance tra transaction that you might not see in your traditional corporate finance deal is the reporting is actually more enhanced, I'd say, than a, like a traditional corporate finance deal. You get kind of quarterly financials and you get annual financials and they just give a compliance certificate and say everything's good. Uh, on especially finance transaction, you can see even weekly 
uh, financial reporting or monthly reporting. So that's that's something that's a little bit different. Um, so just bear that in mind. It's a bit document intensive from the, for the issuer to keep on top of that. The other thing is we're talking about the servicing and the underwriting, and that's really the importance for a lot of these deals. Uh, so you have that snapshot. You know, day one, we've done all this business and legal diligence, but the covenants need to kind of reflect to be able to protect uh, the lender potentially um, about any changes. So typically you'll have covenants around ensuring that they're not making changes to their underwriting policies without your consent because you want to know, you know, you've agreed to, we, we'll, we'll, we'll do this deal on this underwriting policy. Well, what if on day two they just change it and say they're going to underwrite a whole bunch of risky stuff that you're not in the business of doing. So that's just important. So um, keep that in mind. Um, one of the, um, you know, things to focus on is the types of asset classes. And they've been referenced throughout as we've been going through this panel. But uh, I think it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's relevant here to drill down a bit more and in particular talk about what we're currently seeing. <coughs> and, uh, maybe I'll throw it over to Ramit to, to start the discussion on that point. Yeah, so again, the market strong issuers are trying to get the capital in place while it's still available. It is very much available. Uh, we're seeing unprecedented number of proposals come in when we take an opportunity to the capital provider market. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought I was the only one. <laughs> um, no pressure. Um, the active asset classes, at least in Canada, uh, this won't surprise most of you, is our auto, our non prime auto, home improvement. And when I say we've got eight transactions in the market, totaling about 900 million. It's more than one deal in each of these asset classes. It's is what driving this comment. So there's, and then increasingly there's residential mortgages, which wasn't even on, you know, the specialty finance radar until the B20 regulation kicked in. So to state the obvious, what that has done is it's push, it's pushed that borrower who was able to walk into a bank branch and get a mortgage at three and a half percent to the private lender market who can now price, because they can, price the same mortgage at 8% plus some fees. That's changed the residential mortgage market quite remarkably, wherein those private lenders, and now we're getting inbound calls saying, we have not seen such demand since we opened shop 25 years ago. Can you find us you know, 100 to $500 million of capital? And it can't be a Canadian source, likely not, because the banks will be caught by the same B20, because you can't do indirectly what you can't do directly, right? So it's got to be a U.S. source. So there's a real amount of activity in that space. So it's auto, home improvement, residential mortgages, point-of-sale financing has been active, reasonably active. And then there are some, I'd say the, oh, sorry, and, and small business, small business lenders. I, there's not... <laughs> There's not too many of those in Canada uh, compared to consumer lenders, but we've suddenly seen a real uptake in activity amongst. We, we have three transactions in the market, right? Um, which, given how many there are in Canada, that's a lot. That could be a reasonable percentage of the market, right? And then there are some esoteric classes like, um, like Cheryl, what you said, litigation financing. There's one meaningful transaction that got done, the first ever in Canada. Um, and then that's created a bit of a momentum in the next two biggest companies that could become issuers, hopefully in the in the near term. But that's quite a wide gamut of asset classes. Yeah, I mean, we really see um, a pretty wide range, although the types of um, sub-products or categories kind of ebb and flow. Um, a few years ago, we saw a ton of MCA. I mean, it was literally, you know, multiple transactions a month, you know, people with limited or no history or track record or background all of a sudden, you know, within a year or 18 months establishing an MCA business. Um, we were pretty um, cautious because it really did feel like sort of a gold rush and there was just too much capital <coughs> chasing that sector. Um, and there has been a lot of noise, particularly in the states, with regard to MCA and the stacking and the lack of, I'll just call it, you know, transparency in terms of 
you know, who has the rights to, to the cash flows. Um, so we haven't been seeing as much of as MCA, but certainly been seeing plenty of um, rent to own, lease to own, point of sale financing, different types of consumer loans, more litigation finance, um, a lot of small business and different types of um, factoring. And a lot of it has been very niche oriented or industry focused. Um, we have stayed away from and will continue to stay away from because the regulatory environment is just not friendly um, payday lending. Um, we did one transaction <coughs> in subprime auto. Um, the business didn't really, um, wasn't really able to, to continue and get traction. So, um, you know, we, we elected or the company elected um, not to continue to grow. I think that in the context of where we are in the life cycle of the, of the market and don't know when a downturn is coming, but it, it, it will happen at some point. And so there are some products that we're being um, particularly cautious like subprime auto. And, and on payday lending, I, I would say, you know, certainly in Canada, there's been a lot of focus from regulators and tightening of uh, ability to, to charge fees and, and interest. And as a result, we've certainly seen a lot of payday lenders look at other types of asset classes and start to kind of look at winding down and, and uh, uh, discontinuing possibly some of their payday lending business uh, given the, the, the squeeze on profits there. Um, I'm going to try to put the panel a bit on the uh, on uh, you know uh, the hot spot and try to uh, see if anyone wants to uh, crystal ball in terms of future asset classes anything that uh, you know either piques your interest now or you think might be coming down the pipe and I know uh, certainly none of you are expecting this question and uh, also we're on camera so you may not want to answer it but uh, okay. I thought I might as well throw it out there. Um, one sector that we have um, been looking at is the debt settlement space. Um, and also the credit repair space, um, which are, you know, both kind of interesting products, um, at least in the states on the debt settlement side. Um, there were some changes um, from a regulatory perspective a few years ago in terms of when a company could charge the consumer fees for facilitating um, a debt settlement transaction, and the shift was really from charging fees up front um, versus charging fees upon success. So that really did weed out a bunch of players, particularly because they couldn't navigate the working capital requirements of that. Um, we actually have a company that is a payment processor. And so that's just, you know, kind of direct business services. And those um, businesses are typically highly sought after, high margins, really easy to, um, to obtain financing, except this company focused solely on the debt settlement space. And so therein was the opportunity where there was more complexity in the transaction in order to really understand the regulatory environment of the industry that they were serving. So um, those are two products that um, that we've been looking at. The litigation finance space, whether it's actually um, financing cases and providing working capital to law firms or actually sort of factoring and providing an advance on a settlement. So there's sort of multiple flavors within um, litigation finance. We've been on a couple of transactions, haven't, haven't gotten the mandate yet, but it's a space that we're spending more time in. Wants the crystal ball? I, uh, maybe not crystal ball. I just make a comment that that got me excited last week. That there was the first time there was a asset-backed securities issue in Canada done by a non-prime issuer, which is unsecured consumer loans graded, tranched, sold into the ABS market. I mean, that opens a totally new uh, source of capital, potentially for Canadian issuers, which did not exist. Um, it's pretty exciting. Very exciting. It, it does exist. It has existed in the U.S. forever. It's a much deeper market, but that was a very exciting moment. At, you know, on one side of the desk at Deloitte, somebody got excited. 
<laughs> so on on that point, I, yeah, definitely. So you're going to see a lot more liquidity uh, on the primary side and secondary liquidity created as well on the ABS market when it comes to specialty finance transactions. Um, so across a wide range of asset classes, um, so you, you will start to see more online consumer and small business lenders go to the ABS market to reduce their cost of capital to get that more flexibility overall. And you potentially could see a secondary market created on those as well to, start to, to be able to create uh, to trade those on a real-time basis. Um, the other asset class that I have been seeing more recently is the, uh, the credit repair. So that's coming up more frequently. Um, and then the other asset class that just popped up recently is uh, bridge financing for uh, first-time home buyers. On the on the down payment tranche itself, you, you're starting to see some more private lenders get more active in that space. Uh, and as as millennial home buyers try to buy more homes and have to deal with 25% down payments, um, you'll you'll see that asset class start to get a little bit bigger as well. I thought that was the government of Canada that was bridging it. So you actually have a bunch of private lenders doing it as well. Uh, so we've gone a bit over time, so I want to throw it to the floor with questions. It's obviously non-public information, but uh, <laughs> I, well, it, it goes back to traditional credit behavior and monitoring. Like you, you need to do your sensitivities, your curve test, your convexity, really understand your portfolio. Uh, as, as an issuer, you need to understand your loan level data and model that out using swap curves or credit curves overall. Um, so it's once again, it's using that, that institutional capability within specialty finance to really understand your portfolio and monitor what the the twelve year forward looking projections look like for you. Contingencies you have in place. Yes. Are in place. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, we, we use an active approach to risk management. So we're we're looking at a wide range of these items overall. So um, if your if your yield to maturity within your spread market changes that is a factor into your portfolio. You want to understand how your portfolio performs within that. Uh, if you're starting to see, for example, in the U.S., Treasury curves invert, that's, a, that's an indicator that you have to be aware of. Um, there's also a factor of that we, we lend to commercial businesses. So what is the, the debt to appetite of commercial businesses? What does the um, um, total debt exposure look like for a business overall? How does that factor into a, to a business owner? Uh, as you start to see in Canada, a lot more um, consumer debt associated with, with your mortgages. Uh, if your mortgage rate were to, were to be shocked upwards, what happens to your total level of debt exposure on your commercial level as well? So these are all factors that you have to play in in having an advanced risk modeling capability. I would say one of the ways that we um try to, I guess, prepare is that we've talked a lot about the diligence process. We didn't really touch on the, you know, portfolio management side. So in addition to the legal diligence, um, we do a field exam that would really dig into um, the portfolio performance metrics. Um, among other things, and that's something that you do consistently over the life of the loan, whether it's one time a year or maybe two times a year or potentially um, more frequently if there are concerns about either current performance with that borrower and or if you, you know, feel like there's clouds on the horizon and, and you have some concerns. So that's a tool that we use. Other thing to state more the obvious is get committed funding, not less so the uncommitted route. Because it's always been that push and pull for issuers. And if there's a time for us as advisors to tell our clients to go for committed, it's about now. And it takes paying that extra 50 to 100 basis points of fees up front and 25 to 50 basis points of standby fee and the unused amount going forward. It's a good time to consider paying it. It's money well spent. And I think the other thing on that is I think I've seen over the last six months, I've seen uh, borrowers structure their loans completely as a term loan or essentially as a PPS issuance. They've just got all the money up front instead of having to have it committed. They essentially get all the money and they can use it as they need it. Any other questions? Gary, you seem to be holding your mic as though you. Uh... Yeah, I'm, I'm holding my mic, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly getting ready to congratulate the panel on a great deep dive. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
Looks like we have no further questions. So Wynne, Cheryl, Amar, uh, Ramit, and DJ, thank you for your insights, and thank you everyone for attending. Yeah. So uh, I, I, just, I just wanted to close up things by uh, thanking the panel again and thanking Anna for uh, doing such a sterling job uh, emceeing things and moderating things. And thank you again to our uh, sponsors, uh, um, uh, McCarthy for hosting us um, on deck and, and, and Deloitte and the rest of the panel for supporting us. Um, I, I just wanted to also mention, uh, since I have you here captive, that our next event will be uh, June 5th at Blake's on uh, Credit Invisibles. Um, and that's going to be uh, supported by uh, TU and, and Perk's going to come down from Ottawa. Uh, to deliver some research there. So I think that'll be a really fascinating panel. Um, on uh, July 10th, uh, we have open banking, uh, which is obviously uh, a huge theme for uh, our sector uh, being so uh, data focused. And so uh, open banking, uh, that'll be at uh, Denton's uh, July 10th. And then we have hopefully one a month leading up until the summit. So uh, with that, I wanted to thank everybody. Uh, it was a great panel, and I think we all learned a lot, so uh, thanks again. Thank you.